and welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Bajo. And I'm Junglist Badge. I've been thinking all the games publishers must get together for some big secret game release meeting. Go on. Well, you ever notice how we get two games of the same type at the same time? Like Guitar Hero 5 Beatles Rock Band, or next week FIFA Pro Evo, and this week the latest Need for Speed and Colin McRae Dirt. It's the tandem bollocks bump effect, Jung. It's well known in marketing circles. You all know why we're here. Profits are down. To fix this, we need to grab the market, not from one side, but the other side simultaneously, seeing a rise in profits and then an explosion in the marketplace. <laughs> Sit down! Next. Ah, well, it means this week there's gonna be a lot of this. And the game that won best original game at this year's E3, Scribblenauts. And it's a superhero super party in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. But first, can you guess the game for this week? That's so easy. You gotta get the game, not just the character. Still easy. There's a news desk over there and it's got your name on it. Good game. It seems there just aren't enough gamers to go around, as two MMOs announced plans to downsize and switch off servers. Star Wars Galaxies, which has been on the wane for a while now, will be closing down 12 of their 25 game servers from October 15th. Users can transfer their characters for free until that date. Elsewhere, NCSoft's free-to-play MMO Dungeon Runners will be switching off for good on January 1st, 2010. The simple reason, according to producer Stephen Nichols, is that the game just isn't profitable. Fair enough. Unless you've been living under a rock, or just haven't logged out of WoW for the last week, you'll have heard about the classification board's decision to refuse classification on Valve's Left 4 Dead 2, the fourth game to be banned in Australia this year. The main point of contention is the use of melee weapons in the game, such as the axe and chainsaw, which allow for bloody decapitations and the gratuitous severing of limbs, violent content that the classification board deems unsuitable for the maximum rating of MA15+. As long as we still got guns, we are gonna fight. Face palm. Does Square Enix's Yoichi Wada know something we don't? In an interview with the Financial Times, Wada was quoted as saying he expects Nintendo to release a new Wii console by the year 2011 that will function on a similar hardware level as the PS3 and Xbox 360, and which may even come with a new type of controller. He also had nice things to say about Microsoft's Project Natal, which he believes will become standard. A little over two years ago, Codemasters released a masterpiece of rally racing realism in the form of Colin McRae Dirt. Shortly after, Colin McRae tragically died in a helicopter accident with his son, but rather than take a new direction, the latest in the franchise pays tribute to the racing legend, and Colin McRae Dirt 2 pays plenty of homage. This isn't a normal Subaru. It was once driven by the rally legend Colin McRae. You've got some pretty big shoes to fill. Every now and then a game comes along and surprises you with how good it looks, and some of the scenery that gets rendered in Dirt 2 will make you proud of your hardware. It was hard to believe they could improve on the first in the looks department, but they've done it. Yeah, and not to mention the cars themselves. Driving seems a little less forgiving with the turning. You'll have to wean yourself off that tendency to tilt the joystick all the way to the side and instead practice slight movements. Same with the accelerator, and you'll really notice the difference in how it punishes you on the different surfaces from the narrow, gravelly tracks of Croatia. Hairpin right, don't cut. To Sandy Baja. To the jungles of Malaysia. Dip, water, medium right. You can change the difficulty each race to try and get yourself more money and experience. Even on casual difficulty, it's strictly a don't make one mistake affair, but its realism stops short of boring stuff like paying for repairs. There's new modes as well, including Gate Crasher, where you have to smash through as many barriers as you can, getting two seconds added to your time limit for each one you smash through. And then at the end, the winner is the one with the highest time limit. And there's Domination Mode, where overall time doesn't matter, but it's who took out the most sections in a race. But some classic modes have been reworked and improved as well. Yeah, the standard rally mode is something that Colin McRae games do really, really well, and Dirt 2 has improved navigators and seeing other cars on the track to compare and see how well you're doing. 
I wasn't too big a fan of the other racers chit-chatting to me mid-race, though, Badge. Look where you're going, OK? Have you got a death wish? Look what you've done to my car. Something's not right here. I should be at the front. To me, that seemed like a street racing thing, and I've long thought street racers have lost their way by concentrating on the girls around the cars in some kind of bad boy nightlife, rather than the cars and the tracks themselves. But a welcome carryover from street racing is the rewind feature from their last game, Race Driver Grid. Oh. Don't say I didn't warn you. Although most of your races will be full of little bumps and knocks that slowly degrade your car over time, forcing you to use a different kind of rewind. Caution, crest, immediate... Oh! Don't worry, I'm okay. You can see the improvements here, but it also reminded me just how good the original Dirt is. It does have the extras, though, like a rockin' alternative rock soundtrack. Now! And all round, this is a masterful rally game. I'm giving it eight and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. It's more difficult, but worth it once you start to get to know the tracks and master those perfect sliding turns. There's a lot of time to be spent in dirt, whether it's against the AI, which is fine, or against online opponents. I'm giving it nine out of 10 rubber chickens. Good game. Badge, I'm starting to see a trend emerge. Yeah, I know scarves and tight pants. So in right now. No, with the questions. Uh -huh. Seems like every second email is asking us if we're going to review a game or not. And they're big games, like Assassin's Creed 2 or Modern Warfare 2. See if we wouldn't review those. Uh, yeah, I noticed that too. Listen up, folks. The answer to almost all of those review questions is yes, we will review it closer to its release date. Now let us never speak of future reviews again. Agreed. On to some more specific questions now. We got this from Nathan. I'm not much of a PC gamer, but I do have 52 PS2 games. Does this classify me as a pro gamer? If not, what does? Sorry, Nathan, but you could own a billion games and still not be a pro gamer. The term pro gamer only applies to those who actually make a living out of competitive gaming. Hang on, so does it make us programmers, John? No, Badger. When I say competitive, I mean it. You have to be one of the best in the world to be considered a pro at it. But I'm totally awesome at Nintendogs. Yeah, uh, if you feel like you have what it takes to be a pro gamer, try finding a nearby LAN or local area network. Enter a competition, meet some people, see how you go, but they are mainly PC focused. Next, we have this from Clive in Maryland, New South Wales. Can you confirm that there's a wireless microphone coming out for the Xbox 360 that works with all music games? We can do one better for you, Clive, and actually confirm that there's already wireless microphones available on 360 that work with all the music games. Yes, you will have to pick yourself up a copy of the game Lips, though, to get them, but it's a solid singing title if you like the occasional croon. Moving on to this one from Lewis in Sydney. I can't make up my mind on a gamer name. Can you help me? Of course, Lewis! Jung, hand me the disco ball of a thousand truths. I'll just hold that up and... I'm going to a cable of a thousand optics and the monitor of a thousand pixels. Now just enter your first and last name into the Computron and... Lewis... Uh, uh. Ah! Lewis, your gamer name is Lou Lollis Gates. Enjoy. Well, that's all for this week. Don't forget, if you've got a question you want to ask us, just jump onto our website and send us an email. Good game! There's been a heap of hype surrounding Scribblenauts and its seemingly magical database of words, and the idea of being able to conjure up anything you can think of makes it hard not to go into this review with high, maybe even unrealistic expectations. True, John, but we're professionals, and the first thing you do when you get this game is try to break it by thinking of the most ridiculous things possible that wouldn't have any practical use in gameplay. Large Hadron Collider? Yes. Phenoxybenzamine hydrochloride. Yes. More books, minion! Philosoraptor. Great Scott. 
Scribblenauts lets you start creating stuff right off the bat from the menu screen, but once you get that out of your system, it's the puzzle mode and action mode that'll get you hooked. In puzzle mode, the game gives you a very specific objective, such as getting an object from one end of the level to the other, or rescuing someone, with the reward being a shiny starite and some allers, which you can spend on new levels and avatars. In action mode, you simply have to get your character Maxwell to an out of reach starite, with no predetermined rules to jam up your creativity. What's so inspired about Scribblenauts is all the objects you create actually behave like you'd expect them to. You can play with the elements, drive vehicles, annoy animals, build things. You can even turn ninjas into zombies with a Necronomicon. How about pitting an alien, keyboard cat, whale, vampire, Rick Astley, and God all against each other to see what happens? Why not throw in a chainsaw? With most of the puzzles, you usually take the most logical solution just because it lets you progress further and unlock more levels. It can be fiddly getting things to work the way you want them to, and unfortunately the game can become incredibly frustrating. Physics get a bit wacky, and the camera control is just painful. It makes me hate. You control the view manually with the D-pad, but the camera is constantly snapping back to Maxwell automatically just when you don't want it to. I shouldn't have to be fighting the game simply to look at the end of a level. It's made worse by the fact that the only way you can move Maxwell is by tapping on the screen. So you're continually ordering him to move to an object when all you wanted to do is select that object. Maxwell... Why couldn't the D-pad be used for movement and maybe a shoulder button for camera control? It's crazy badge and it very nearly derails the whole game, but thankfully it's not a total deal breaker. Scribblenauts is still an amazingly compelling game. Even though most of the levels are trial and error based, I never felt like ripping it out of my DS in a rage. Yeah, you find yourself forgiving the game's flaws pretty quickly because it's constantly surprising you and it's really cool when something unexpected happens. you get to enjoy an impressive amount of creative freedom. So the process of figuring out how things work becomes addictive. Yeah, absolutely. Mucking about with insane solutions is heaps of fun. And it makes you realize that there hasn't really quite been a game like this ever before. It can be a little tempting to overuse some items, like wings, to get around. But when you come back and replay the levels, it forces you to think of different solutions, which naturally ups the difficulty. We should also mention that there's a level editor as well. You can use any level of the game as a template and then throw in objects to create your own puzzles. Beings can be given basic behavioral properties, such as making a knight want to protect a princess and making a dragon want to eat her. It's not a very in-depth system, but with some planning, you can come up with some pretty cool ideas. There are a lot of levels to get through. Some of them are surprisingly tricky, and it's the kind of game where you'll put it down until an idea pops into your head and then you'll pick it up and have another crack at it. Well, that's what's so clever about it. Essentially, this game gives you tens of thousands of tools, and all you need to do is use them cleverly. I did wish you could pause it while building complex contraptions, but this is a really impressive follow-up to Drawn to Life. I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rooster hat rubber chickens. You have to admire the genius behind the concept, and even though the fiddly physics made me want to snap my stylus in two, jam them into my eyeballs, use a cheese grater over the top of that, and throw in some lemon salt, and then more cheese grater, and then more stylus, it was a bit of a love-hate relationship I had with this game, but I kept coming back for more. I'm giving eight and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. Australia has some of the world's greatest video gamers, but you've probably never heard of them. Yeah, we've always said Aussies punch above their weight in competition. And over the next few weeks, we'll be introducing you to the locals who punch the hardest. Whether they're the toughest, fastest or highest scoring, these are the stories of Australia's best gamers. My name's John O'Pearson. I'm the world champion Tetris player, and I live in Yarrabool in the Southern Highlands. The first time I played Tetris was in year 11 against a friend from my IT class. And we just started playing it as a joke, really, because we used to know about the game from years ago. It was just the notorious Tetris puzzle game. We wanted to see how good we could get at it. And he would always beat me, but then I came to school one day with roughly 1,500 lines, and he stopped playing Tetris. I currently play Lockjaw, which is the world's fastest Tetris clone. I am the world record holder for it. I, I prefer Lockjaw as opposed to regular Tetris, just because you're able to customise the game and get rid of all animations, making the game substantially faster than your average Tetris. So I really um, yeah, get kicks off just watching people's reaction and watching them laugh at the speed and think that it's fake or not real. It's really um, a compliment more so than anything for someone to think my video is fake. 
I play 40 lines mode more so than most. I clear 40 lines in 25 seconds, which is roughly four pieces per second on the screen. All right, I get a really big adrenaline rush from playing Tetris at high speeds, and just a lot of satisfaction, I guess, after you've got the run perfectly on Tetris and you just get very efficient times, I guess. Just makes you feel good. I also had the top score for a while for Tetris Zone Sprint Mode, which is also known as 40 Line Mode. I had the top score for Tetris Splash for the Xbox 360, again, 40 Line Mode. There's probably a few more, but that's all I can think of just off the top of my head. <laughs> when setting a new world record for Tetris, I'll generally play two to three hours a day for roughly five to ten days straight. Just so I'm, you know, very familiar with all the situations that can arise, all the block patterns, basically. Just so I'm assured I can play to my best. The thing that really drives me and pushes me to play Tetris, I guess, is just I feel that if you're going to do something and really have a lot of passion about it, you may as well be the best or just give it all that you can. Good game. Jung, I've been Batman for a few weeks now, but I'm afraid it's time we parted ways because Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 is here and, of course, I have to be Wolvie. Are you ready for some fanboy beat-em-up action? Absolutely not. I mean, yes. The first Marvel Ultimate Alliance was okay, but it suffered from frame rate issues when anything spectacular happened. And it also had terrible, terrible online lag that made it unplayable. And quite frankly, pretty boring combat, to be honest. The sequel is a huge step up in many areas. Yeah, it's definitely better than the last. There's heaps of Marvel characters that get unlocked as you play through the game. And they have kind of okay standard combos, but really it's their super abilities that you should be getting excited about. Naturally, each character has their own strengths and weaknesses, and even immunities. If you're a ranged character, such as Iron Man, you're better off taking out melee and vice versa. This engine is a lot stronger than the first, and the game runs smoothly with lots of fancy shine. The new effects, like Storm's co-op fusion combined with camera shaking and blur, finally do these great characters justice. Fusion effects are built up by taking out other enemies, and they're very powerful, but even though most of them essentially have a double, you know, they look a bit the same, you don't care because, well, just look at them. They're cool. After about three hours, you'll be forced to make a political decision to either support the Superhero Registration Act or oppose it. This affects new missions, abilities, and even new heroes that you unlock. Once you register, I'm sure we'll have a productive relationship. The paperwork is right here. Step up and sign, please. Naturally, we rebelled, and as you go through the game fighting heroes that you once commanded, it's very clever in the way they change, the way they speak to you and their whole tone, so even though you know they're essentially good, they come across still as villains. Fights are littered with mini-bosses and whole screens are full of goons, which can get a bit messy at times. Yeah, it's kind of like when you stare at ants for a long period of time and then they all go a bit blurry and just kind of phase out, you know? Where'd they go? Your analogies are getting weirder every week, Badge. But yeah, when missile guys and shielded enemies are thrown into the mix, it adds priorities to your target. In co-op, which has a maximum of four players, focus fire is your friend, and on harder difficulties, communication is key. We could only test out local co-op, and it worked really well, but we could not connect to an online random match without having ridiculous unplayable lag, and we couldn't even connect four friends together. It just would not happen, and it drove me crazy. Yeah, no region locking options is unforgivable in this day and age, especially on a game built around co-op. It's the same as the first one, and we're baffled as to why. I guess Australian pings are low on the priority list for some developers, Jung. But, you know, besides the old bug which leaves you stranded on another astral plane, this is a great beat-em-up with... mainly because of the visuals, they're so stunning, and also every piece of environment has some sort of level of destruction. And I enjoy destructioning all of it. I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, despite a temperamental camera and the odd situation where your teammate AI decides to go to sleep, 
there are some really spectacular moments to enjoy here. Sure, it gets a bit samey if you do it all at once, but in short bursts, this is a really decent old school beat em up with lasers. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. You're playing with the big boys now. Jung, do you know what I have the need for? Delicious sandwiches. No speed. Need for Speed Shift is the latest in hit and miss races from Electronic Arts, but this time things aren't so miss because it's really awesome and a change of direction for the series. And it's about time too, Jung, because the series hasn't really been changing for the good in the last few years. We reviewed it on PS3 and Xbox 360. Yes, Need for Sandwiches has struggled to find its place in the world of tomorrow, but Shift jumps right into the hardcore with racing lines, heaps of modding and tuning options, 65 licensed vehicles and 18 real-world locations, some of which are reminiscent of the early Need for Speeds. There's no cops, no cheesy cutscenes. It's all about getting into the Need for Speed World Tour and becoming the best racer in the world. Your goal and final destination is the NFS World Tour. But the best part is it's completely accessible with driving options you can change on the fly, and the easy difficulty setting is actually easy. Um. I know. There's enough arcade here to keep people like me happy and enough simulation to allow hardcores to punish themselves with things like removing driving lines, steering control, traction control, and turning on full damage, just to name a few. It's really worth spending the time to make this your type of racer. I found personally turning off all the driving assists and playing on an easier difficulty was much more fun. And there's no shame in playing on easy, Jung. Yes, there is. I like the HUD badge. There's a slight delay and a, a wobble when your car takes a bump. You especially notice these bumps in the cockpit view, which can be very stressful, especially if your windscreen gets messed up, which ours did a fair bit. And you know, at first, Jung, I was like, OK, this is, this is great, but I'm not really getting that sense of speed. And then we got a Porsche. became our enemy and if you've ever, not that I ever recommend doing this, if you've ever hurtled breakneck speed down a hill in a shopping trolley, you'll understand the feeling of risk you get at high speed in this game when you clip a bit of the grass or your wheels turn over a bump. Are we the only show in the world that can convincingly compare a shopping trolley to a Porsche? Well, only us and Antique Roadshow, John. If you get crash happy, the camera will fly around as your head jerks and there's additional blur effects and black and white effects just to give you more stress. What's next, John? Regenning health? A co-op wave mode? A chainsaw on the bonnet? Dual wielding? None of those things are next, Badge. You get aggression or precision points based on how you drive, and this is used to help with your online matchmaking. So you're not the only one driving like a maniac using other cars to break for you when you push corners too hard. And you will find those corners that you smash into every time until you know the tracks. You really notice the offline AI too. Cars will go for overtakes, they'll spin out in the dirt, and apparently some of the drivers have personalities as well. The only thing the AI doesn't do here is reset quickly, and this encourages you to be an aggressive driver because if you flip a car or knock it into a wall, you can forget about them giving you grief for the rest of the game. Time trials have all the cars on the track at once, which makes for some interesting gameplay, and the drifting rounds are strangely addictive. I like how they've gone to the effort of actually recording dialogue for every single tip, for every tweak in the game. 
To manage greater horsepower, we'll fit a twin plate clutch, and a lightened flywheel will improve engine response. There's something about hearing someone explain what this tweak actually does to your car, which is so much better than reading a wall of text. There are still a few in there that make you go... We install a three-inch full exhaust system to free up extra horses. What? Yeah, and the tweaking is noob-friendly badge, and there's those extra levels there for the tweaking enthusiasts. There's not a lot to complain about here. Usually, if you don't like something, there's an option to fix it. There's no split screen, but that's been on the decline in racers for a while now. In short, it's been given a lot of love, and the franchise needed it. I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, my only beef is that every time you buy a new car, it throws up that menu, would you like to pay real money for imaginary things? And they had that in Undercover as well, and that really bugs me. But this is a great racer, and it's the most fun I've had since Burnout 3 Takedown. I'm giving it 9.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Good game. Good gamers. Were you able to crack the mystery game this week? It was Wolverine Adamantium Rage on the Super Nintendo, bub. A side-scrolling, platform-based slash em up in which Wolverine had to go about sniffing out clues to his own origin. Which basically just meant eviscerating anything that got in his way. Rage! Next week, it's another tandem bollocks bump as we check out Pro Evo and FIFA 10. And one of the most anticipated MMOs of this year, Aeon. Well, that's put another show to bed, Jung. Uh, just a reminder, there's heaps of extra stuff on the site this week. Until next week, gamers, Bajo out. Junglist out. <laughs>